you. I'm happy to be here. <laughs> um, like Amy said, I'm uh, the sales and production director of the Kansas City Food Hub, and I started with the Food Hub about a year ago, but um, I remember when the Hub was getting started and conversations were happening in Kansas City and in Lawrence in 2010, 11. Um, I was out in the field wishing I could be in those conversations, so I'm happy to be here today in this position um, and seeing how far we've come. Um, this grant um, came along at the perfect time for us. Um, like I said, 2011, 2012, we were uh, just in conversation and then um, feasibility studies, conversations were happening, questions were asked, surveys were done, farmers were brought in, buyers were polled um, in the years to follow, 2013, 2014, and then uh, at the end of 2014, um, Katie Nixon and Marlon Bates called for farmers to come show up and build this thing. Um, they got together and they put the framework together. The Food Hub was launched in 2016, and when this opportunity came up in 2017, it was time for us to really look at um, our branding, look at food safety, and look at traceability of our product going backwards. So uh, 2016, the Food Hub was launched, and we had the mission to uh, join together, to bring farmers who um, had been working hard, who had been going to markets and had been growing, um, maybe having a CSA, um, give them another opportunity to aggre aggregate product and reach the middle market. Uh, we started selling to restaurants that we already had relationships with. We reached out to corporate cafeterias, look, like Hallmark and the kitchens that Bon Appetit um, ran, um, small locally owned grocery stores, and we started talking to schools. Uh, the farmers that came together and that are still um, involved in the Food Hub, um, there are 15 of us. There were 15, and the there were five in the first year, and then 10, and now last year we grew to 15. We're looking at about three new growers joining us in the next month or so. Um, it was important to the founders to maintain farmer ownership and also for the Food Hub to be run by farmers. We um, have a collective 250 years of experience growing. There's 40 or more high tunnels and greenhouses on our property. We're scattered around Kansas City out to 125 miles at the most. Most of our farms are within 75 miles of Kansas City and then um, even 40 miles um, um, so closer in. Uh, when we started talking about uh, the Food Hub, we thought that we would bring food um, from 250 miles out into the city to feed our two million people. We may do that, <coughs> but as it's grown and as the idea of the Food Hub has spread word of mouth, um, farmers who see what's going on call us, or farmers who are in the Hub and are talking to other farmers at market call us, so it's really spreading word of the mouth really in an organic way. Um, to give you an idea, I always like to have a graphic um, or a geographic um, picture so you can see that we really are scattered um, around Kansas City. So to the project, we wanted to work on branding. We, and um, at that time when we were just getting started, we had a logo. Um, we were just putting processes in place. We were figuring out the language of, of working together and the method of working together and like even how to drive to the, to the buyer and how to have those conversations. We were really young. Um, it's one thing for one person to go out and knock on a door, but as a group to figure out what your message is and how to reach that audience and how we're even going to bring cucumbers from one farm and potatoes from another farm and get it in one place. There was just a lot to figure out. So um, we spent a year or so doing that. Uh, in the second year, we really went after um, partnerships and systems and reaching out to the community even more. So while we were looking inward in the first year and the second year in 2017, it was the perfect time to start branding and start thinking about who we were. It's too bad you can't really see this um, upside down <laughs> picture. Um, in 2016, we spent a lot of money on um, 
getting a professionally done marketing campaign. So we paid professionals, we paid consultants. They said, you should be called this name. We don't say it anymore. You should use these colors. We don't use them anymore. <coughs> and we wondered um, why it wasn't taking off. And still, you know, it's a funny thing. When the professional tells you you should do something one way and then you spend money for it, you kind of continue down that path. And, and I'm, I'm really proud of the leadership of the hub in the end of 2017, once we got this grant and we started really asking these tough questions. They said, okay, enough is enough. If we cannot even remember the right way to say the name of the hub, we say it backwards more often than we say it the right way, um, and the community can't say it the right way, um, let's just change the name. Let's change the name to our nickname that we've always been anyway. So we started calling ourselves the Kansas City Food Hub. And since then, we have really started putting together the branding and identification around that. So we started with cutesy fun stuff, right, of farms, um, of farmers. We have always um, wanted to maintain that we are farmers, we are farmer run, we are the real deal. In a, in a city that 18 broadline distributors are talking about local food and are um, peddling their food as local as far as five, 600 miles out, uh, we really needed to show faces of farmers. Uh, we really need to show that this food was grown 20 miles or 50 miles um, from your place. So this farm is Moyer Farm in Richmond, Missouri. Uh, he's really one of our, one of the two bigger anchor farmers that we have. and. Um, we use his photos a lot. Uh, we get a lot of feedback on our logo, how it looks honest. And that's a really solid thing, I think. I mean, I want people to believe what, what we're saying is what we're doing. We also use a lot of stories. Our stories are um, really um, sell the product as much as the product sells the product. And, um, uh, this is Jacob Thomas with the sheep in the background. I love that photo. I really want to use his six-week-old baby <laughs> photo, but he won't let me yet in our marketing, so maybe in a year's time we can use a toddler's photo. But <laughs> uh, we like to show that our farmers are real people, working hard, you know, going to market and selling a little produce wholesale on the side. We want to show our happy chefs and how professional they are and how proud they are. The idea is like, let's be like this chef. Let's be proud and strong and um, smart and clean, buy our product, right? We also want to show off the um, most extreme and fancy produce that we have. So we use turmeric in a high tunnel um, in all our, you know, oftentimes. And then, of course, winter production in that um, awesome romaine lettuce. Um, you know, something happened with <laughs> my slides. Um, Branding is more than advertising. It's more than telling a story so I can sell a product, right? It's uh, really who we are and how we show up every day, how we um, have conversations and how we move around. And when we started really looking at this and looking who we are in Kansas City, um, this grant helped us participate in ways that um, we may not have. Um, it funded our um, uh, operations directors, um, participation in the con uh, the convergence. Um, Kansas City, a lot of people are working in the food systems and coming together and talking and have big conversations. Um, so it funded her time to participate that way, to join in and really move the needle on local food, move the needle so that we could all have better, healthier lives and that farmers could make a better living. So um, as much as that message can be told, we try to tell it. There are many other ways that advertising and, and branding helped us a lot. We tried to tell our story in a way that we could show that why we were still small farmers and while we um, are family farms, we also um, were consistent. We were farmers that would show up with the product that you needed when you needed it, what you ordered, and it would look the same week to week. So uh, we were fortunate enough to um, develop and then to um, to share the message of our anchor growers. So you saw a photo of the Moyer Farm in Richmond and then an El Dorado Spring, south of Kansas City, there's another anchor grower. So we were able to um, market the staples while we show off the more specialty um, herbs and things. 
um, something else about branding is showing up right consistently, showing up um, same time, same way, same day, looking the same with the same ability to um, get orders or to send out our information. Talked a little bit about <coughs> participating in the, in the community. And so um, because we are in Kansas City and having these conversations, uh, we know people. <coughs> and you know, when you know people, um, that whole brand that you carry with you is, a, is desired, right? We are known as growers who um, have some experience, growers who now have hit a market that uh, has not been open to growers this size in the past, and so we are sought after in collaborations and grant projects in, in a whole series of um, conversations. Um, the second part of the grant was to develop our food safety plans and to look at GAP and to look at FSMA. Um, and it's a lot more straightforward, right? So um, I only have a slide about this, but our partners with K-State, I can't say enough, right, about the, the partnerships we had at K-State Extension and also at the Olathe Station who um, showed up and um, asked us what we needed. Um, Cal Jamerson is a farmer himself from Florida, and he recently joined the, the staff at K-State at Olathe. And he was able, because of his um, wholesale experience, um, really show up and, and have real conversations with growers who were looking to learn from another grower. We did on-farm individual pre-assessment audits. Um, we would come to a farm, we had an appointment, we walked around the farm, kind of a scary thing. As inspectors, well, I tagged along, Cal was the, the guy. So he would walk around as an inspector, ask a few questions, the farmer would, you know, show, do this two-hour, um, um, talking through, showing, showing processes, and then we would sit down at the kitchen table. And um, a really neat thing happened when we sat down at the kitchen table. Um, so what could have been a really um, hard conversation, it was open and kind. And I would say it was a little bit because of Cal and his, and his persona, but also um, sitting at the kitchen table, uh, we were able to ask him questions. We were ab able to ask the inspector questions. There's those air, s air quotes. Uh, while we were gaining information from him, and he would point out what we needed to improve upon. And so uh, the farmer at that point was supposed to go home and do homework or get to work and do homework and create the food safety plan from there. Um, and then finally, um, the workshops um, that we all attended um, were the second piece of the the grant, the second piece of that portion, and then we, um, we did the post audits as well. Um, part of that also is a mock audit that we do um, annually. We're hearing less and less um, from people requesting GAP. We're not yet selling to hospitals, and, and we know that for hospitals we will have to be more, um, more of our farms will need to be GAP certified. We are hearing um, we are hearing a lot more people just asking for food safety plans. So as I go into restaurants, I really try and uh, ask them or let them know that each of our farms has a food safety plan, and we have a cold chain. We have recording done at our sub hubs where the food is delivered and aggregated and then distributed from, and um, and together we're working to um, increase the knowledge of each farm as they come on. Um, and then just a sidebar, there's a, a lot more people asking these days about third-party um, certifications for animal welfare. So that's something that we're starting to look into. And um, just by a little bit of research that I'm doing is um, the, the cost is varying widely. So um, more to come about that. It's just a brand new thing for me. Uh, and then traceability is the is the third piece of this. It goes hand in hand with food safety, but um, the way we were able to address it and what we gained out of the traceability is the whole. Um, am I on the right slide? Was the whole um, system of 
sending out the orders from the buyers to the growers and how the boxes were labeled. We did it one way. I think when a single farm, it's, 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 a, it's a little bit different than asking 15 farmers of a all, over, all over the countryside to use the same box, to use the same labeling, to have the same um, look to their box and the same traceability. And we were able to um, standardize that, and we were also able to use these uh, food safety um, forms at the, at the sub hubs. So food safety in practice um, looks like this. Um, the order would go out to the, to the farmer, and along with that order would be the box number and the, and the um, buyer code. Product was harvested and washed and, and then somehow delivered to the sub hub. Uh, the food hub has been organized at, with a series of sub hubs about 40 miles outside of Kansas City. So the farmers further out would get their product to the sub hub. It would be checked in. Um, you can see all the, the traceability on that farm and or at that on that form and then picked up at the sub hubs and carried to the to the buyer. So as we look at our fourth year of sales, I would say that we stand on the edge of of success finally, right? Um, the the big thing for me is that the buyers now know that it's safe or the growers now know that it's safe to continue to grow, and that might sound like a bit of a strange thing to say, but uh, three or four years ago, uh, I was afraid that we would lose growers, and the weather is bad, the climate is changing, and um, without the buyers there, it's um, without being able to meet that demand, it's a pretty terrifying thing, but I'm reassured now as we go out and talk to more buyers and as more growers hear about what we're able to move around. Um, we're getting phone calls and we're getting people to join us. Um, we are developing a protein line, a CSA this year. Um, the CSA will let other growers join us who aren't growing a huge amounts of any particular item, but who grow specialty amounts, maybe a little bit of cilantro, or who have fermented items that they could join in and they would diversify our product at the same time. So um, we are always trying to get better. So uh, while I have great pride in the work that we've done so far and where we are, um, I still struggle with the farmers who take all their best product to farmer's market, and I go and visit them, and they try and hide it from me, <laughs> <laughs> of course, you know. So um, climate change, of course, is a problem. Um, we've had great, um, we were very fortunate last year to work with a great partner that helped us with deliveries and, um, and distribution. Uh, this year we don't have that, so we are spending um, February sitting down and figuring out where we can buy a reefer truck or a refrigerated sprinter van or anything that might move our vegetables around, so we're looking for that, um, but we're figuring that out. We're always streamlining processes and, and systems. and. Um, while it's wonderful that so many people are engaged and we're transparent and inclusive with our farmers, uh, it's also sometimes hard for decisions to be made. So uh, I'm very proud that we just got our one inch um, KC Food Hub labels delivered this week and after a year and a half of trying to get that done, that's a huge success. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it, there's a lot of talking and it's a, it's a wonderful, um, thing to work together, and, um, and I feel that we are, we are getting there. Uh, when we talk to buyers or, and when we talk to farmers and they, um, they talk about joining the food hub, what they say more than anything is that they hope to belong to something more than them, that they do hope that they can reach new markets and they hope they won't have to go to four, four markets a week any longer, and of course they want to sell their vegetables so they can send their kids to college. I'm not saying that's not important, but um, what I hear over and over is that to belong to some group, um, to know that they're not out there alone is, is of great importance to them. So happy to be here. Uh, thank you for all listening. Uh, I'm here for questions, um, and there's another messed up slide. <laughs> Uh, 
the gentleman asked if there are any paid employees of the food hub. And we have, since the beginning, since 2016, have had a, a director who is a all jack, jack of all trades. So I do a little bit of everything. Tom asked, uh, how have things changed? How have we progressed since the early days of the feasibility study and the surveys done? At, those time, at that time, there was an estimated $125 million of unmet demand for local food in the area. 58% um, of the people surveyed said they were interested in buying more local food. I think 68% of the farmers who were interviewed said they were interested in participating in some kind of aggregation. Uh, so as I'm out talking with farmers, they're at least <coughs> curious. So I don't know if I, how if I can put a number to how that 68% has changed. What I hear, though, more and more is just curiosity, um, putting the t your, uh, toe in the water. Like, what does it feel like to work with a group? How might it be better to work with a aggregator or a group, uh, a cooperative like we are, rather than work alone? Am I willing to take less money <coughs> than if I was um, working alone and selling still at market? I'll add on to that that we are we we believe that the product that the farmers grow that we have for sale uh, belongs to the farmers until the sale is made. Um, w I was pretty animate last spring that we needed to look at the prices. Um, the first two years we were using prices that uh, the uh, previous person got from the Chicago terminal market. Um, so they were conventionally <coughs> grown, mass-produced pr um, prices, product prices. And last spring, um, being a grower myself, I knew that product that I was seeing here was much different. And so we, um, during our collective crop planning conversations, we also included pricing. And uh, five of our growers are certified organic, and ten of them are sustainable, family-owned. Um, um, so we had a wide, wide range of opinions and pretty solid opinions um, of what the product was worth. So not only at market, but a lot of the growers were also selling wholesale at that time. So we used that wisdom and we, you know, um, jockeyed back and forth and we got a, a price for the product that everybody could live with. Um, and then at that time, on top of that, we would add 20%. So we add 20% for the hub on top of the price that the farmer set. Um, and so that intrigues people who just are sticking their toe in and wondering how it might be. Um, as far as how much we've been able to um, change or move the needle on local food, um, I, I feel tremendously hopeful like um, in this room and between farmers and uh, between growers in Kansas City, there sh is no competition. There should be no competition because the product that we have is so small and has only begun to reach uh, the markets that it can reach, um, and it's a completely different product than what's out there already. So um, the more we work together, and I think we're fortunate in this region that we are working together to see how we can make that happen. Right. So the question is, how do we separate or identify certified organic product? produce um, separate from conventional produce. And I'm sorry to use those blunt terms, but that's the wholesale market, right? So if you're not certified organic, you're considered conventional. And that's the piece, I think, of this whole wholesale idea that hurts the most. Um, we have, right, because the um, sustainably grown produce op should get a higher price than conventional produce, but not able to, to really have that conversation. Uh, every week put we put out an availability sheet and we are um, developing an online local food marketplace platform that will let this all be um, more online. Right now I send a spreadsheet out to um, a list of maybe 20 buyers that we normally work with. Um, they fill it out and get it back to me in the next couple weeks. It's a list, so the top of the list is conventional and then we have an organic section as well. Uh, there are a handful of buyers who buy only certified organic produce, so I do a modified list and send them only the certified organic produce. And then the whole commingling thing that we have to follow, we maintain that in the sub hubs. So, and that is at a different price? 
Yes, sir. Yeah, so the, the certified farmers came up with their price and the farmers who aren't certified organic came up with their price. The question is how do we maintain quality and how do we maintain standards for quality across the board? Um, lots of conversation, lots of talking and kind of some hard conversations sometimes. We have this uh, concept, it's not a thing yet, but it's a concept of a, of a yellow sheet that a farmer would get if I got a box of beets that aren't quite right. You know, it happens less often than what you might think. Uh, the 15 growers that we are have experience, are market growers, so they know what, how to take care of the product, how to, how to hold it, how to wash it, how to box it. I would say the problems that we have have been more like within one box, an inconsistent size. Mm -hmm. I want to see potatoes all the same size and there'd be some little ones and some big ones. So we have that conversation. Some buyers might not mind. If the buyer would mind, then would fix that. Uh, because we're still small and because our buyers are all within maybe 20 miles of the center of town, we're able to get to that place and fix that problem um, as quickly as possible. But you bring up the, the question of problems and um, we have struggled with um, circling back at the end and getting um, invoicing to the buyers in time and collecting that and it's just that last piece of the puzzle that has been the hardwood. Um, we expect that in the future, I keep looking at Tom Buller, he's one of the founding members of the farm, of the food hub, um, and we work closely to make sure that the um, billing happens and the farmers are paid, um, but that's a hard piece because we've had, we've, it's been too decentralized um, over the last couple of years. We're gonna bring it home and, and take care of it now, um, more between us and closer. Um, does that make sense? Okay, so the question is for the ugly produce or the produce that may not be boxed exactly the way it needs to go to the buyer, what do we do with that? Um, there's a couple of, there's a couple things that we're doing. We don't see a lot of it, first of all. Okay. The farmers are really good about sending me what needs to go. They, we, we have constant phone calls or texts and lots of conversation back and forth. They'll text me a picture. I mean, that's amazing, right? They can be in the field and text me a picture. Um, it wasn't that way 10 years ago. So there's a lot less quality issues than you might expect. Um, farmers individually are donating to after the harvest or to harvesters, and so they're taking care of that. Um, we stockpiled some sweet potatoes and winter squash over the winter. Uh, uh, a friend organization, actually the folks who delivered for us all last year are in kind of a bind right now, so we had 300 extra pounds of winter squash, so I delivered that this week to their soup kitchen so they could feed people. So that's, the ho that's a whole part of being at the table and having, um, being invited and having a voice there. We know who's out there and, um, you know, I expect we kind of owed that, we owed them, right? They made deliveries for us last year, so it's not like I was donating anything to them. I was, in a lot of ways, paying back for the gifts that they've <coughs> already given us. And um, we see a lot of that happening in Kansas City. People when it's around food, they're really generous. She's, uh, she's asking for um, information about how we crop plan. Uh, and we do do that collectively. Uh, I can tell you what we did this year, and we talked a bit about last year. I don't know how it was at the very, very, very beginning. Maybe Tom will answer that. But w the organic growers got on a phone call, um, and the conventional growers got on a phone call, and we just talked it out for about two hours each. And you know, I shared some information that I had from the buyers, uh, and the farmers shared what they would like to sell. We talked about varieties. Uh, it's really interesting to be on a phone call. I mean, you can imagine talking to four or five other people and, and knowing when to throw it out, knowing, you know, and these are really gentle, sweet, kind people <coughs> too, so they don't want to, um, they, they don't want to hurt my feelings and they don't want to say, I'm growing that. Um, so sometimes they have to coax them into, mm -hmm. you know, claiming what they want to grow. I need to know what they want to grow. And um, then we also even talked about goals, like, um, I asked them all to set goals for how much they wanted to sell through the hub. Um, it's one thing, right, to, to, to do one or the other, but they really do need to come together. So consistency in quantity uh, really is becoming an important 
part of that, um, of looking at that. So when we're selling to a corporate cafeteria or to a school, uh, they just really need to know that some solid pro product that they can use is going to be delivered when they need it. Um, we now have a couple of big growers that we're calling anchor growers, and we're looking at those guys to really get our foot in the door of schools and in the corporate cafeteria so that they can depend on us. And they kind of make way for the, uh, the smaller growers who um, have a little bit of flexibility in what they grow. Um, it makes the, our whole package more attractive. At the same time, it's, it's, um, it's a lot of volume of negotiation trying to um, talk with a grower who plans on growing zucchini and peppers or grew that last year for the hub and learned the hard way that w I wasn't going to sell any of that for them um, because we have an anchor grower that grows those things, right? So, and uh, none of us knew that that would be an issue. So we kind of moved through that in a, in a uncomfortable way last year. I just made a broad um, broad decision to, like when a farmer starts selling the cucumbers, that guy's got the sale until he's all gone with his cucumbers. And then the other one who has them can come up behind. I mean, with limited buyers, um, I couldn't see any better way to do it. I asked for folks to help me do it a better way, but it was um, not perfect, but at least it was fair down the line for everybody. Um, so I think when we started out, crop planning was actually one of the hardest things um, because it was really a chicken or egg thing. Like the farmers didn't want to commit to grow something until we had buyers and the buyers didn't want to commit to buy from us until we had farmers who had uh, proven that they could grow those things. Um, so I think the crop planning at the beginning was really like kind of like let's sit around. We originally identified eight crops that were going to be our core crops. And I think after we identified that, before we actually started selling anything, that kind of went out the window. And it ended up being the first couple of years a little bit more of selling what people had extra for um, because they weren't comfortable enough knowing that we could sell it. And there were a few instances of people planting things that um, uh, someone before Alicia had told them we <laughs> could sell and we could not sell. And so there there were some hard feelings. Um, the other thing that I think fits into this and kind of is maybe a backdrop for some of Alicia's comments are, um, I think working in a cooperative food hub is certainly not for everyone. And the people that have come to the table and stayed at the table are people that have a little bit of give and take. And if Alicia makes that executive decision that um, she's gonna stick with that anchor growers produce and not sell my zucchini, like you have to be okay with that and the people that aren't okay with that. Um, I don't know that we've had those, but they figure out, I think before they even would join that this isn't the right thing for them. Yeah, because I know some of those people and they've gone other ways after some conversations with us. So we're pretty transparent about that and it is very cooperative. And it, like, uh, you know, I think transparency is the heart of that crop planning process. So it's not, someone feels like they're getting the inside deal and. Yeah, yeah. Transparency is the thing. Um, we're talking about the way people make their livelihoods and um, what we take pride in, and, and I'm dismissing it. Like, I try to be <coughs> careful about that, and a lot of conversations have, you know, we have, and I think together we're getting smarter. Um, together we're um, understanding better where the holes are, where our opportunities are. We're learning that the protein line is a really big opportunity for us, but even there, when we talk about protein, um, you know, we have, this, it's across the board what we have, certified organic eggs all the way down, well, certified organic eggs, brown non-GMO eggs, conventionally grown white eggs, and then you have to have different prices for all that, and who fills those slots, and how do we advertise, and um, there's a lot. How do we handle seasonality? Season. Uh, all of, I think the buyers know that it's winter, and uh, we, even though we have high tunnels, we're not able to have tomatoes. Um, the buyers that are sourcing from us now are pretty savvy, have been around for a while, and um, if they don't, we share with, in fact, someone asked me today for sweet potatoes and um, she didn't want to take three boxes 
um, because she was afraid they would spoil. And so we have that conversation. They probably won't spoil, but I can't really afford to deliver one box of sweet potatoes 40 miles away. So um, it's hard, right? Because uh, we're not doing sales officially this month, and I don't want to leave those people um, hanging. Uh, we told them all year, and we have really tried to show up with what we promised all year long and to hold on to them. So now not to have a constant check-in with me, um, I worry a little bit, but I also worry, I do worry more about not having our systems in place. So what I'm, I'm, I'm going to do kind of this middle ground and just do the check-ins with them now. So check in, sit down and have meetings. And um, we're staying real to them. Uh, I had an hour and a half conversation yesterday where I was on the phone able to tell three or four stories about our farmers. Um, wild, you know, like wild stories about barns burning down and about new babies and, you know, starting a CSA and how that's going to make room for smaller growers to, to join us. So um, con communication. So there's some, the question is, um, some of the buyers have signed contracts with um, distribution companies that make them promise to buy a certain amount all year long. Um, and do the, are the, do, are the buyers fearful for that? I think that we are not big enough yet that we are pressuring, we are not really financially or um, volume wise pressuring the big guys. Big guys are calling us though, the big guys know we're here and at some level they are a little bit, um, worried or at least you know uncomfortably aware that um, we're coming up the question is um, are the buyers also telling the story of the farmer to their constituents and um, in a lot of times they are uh, they all ask for our logo so that in a cafeteria they could say Kansas City Food Hub broccoli um, Green Acres Market up um, north of the river in Kansas City um, had a big display of the food hub and farmers and um, displayed um, pictures and we had a whole case. Um, many of the restaurants we sell to have a chalkboard that they name the farmers or on the back of their menu or on their website they name the farmers. Um, schools that are selling our produce um, also advertise and um, share that with the, with the families in their, in their newsletters. We could always do more. I could always do more marketing. I could always do, you know. <laughs> we definitely need a marketing plan, and we just haven't. Right now, we're just kind of, yes. Ah, that's a good question. How big are the anchor farms, and are any of the anchor farms certified organic? I would say we have two anchor farms now, and I, I guess I don't want to say that the anchor farms are selling the majority of the product. They're not any they are equally important as the smaller farms. They're important because we're able to get our foot in the door with some staple, more um, needed product. But without the fancy, fun turmeric and ginger and arugula, um, we're not going to stay in the door. We're not going to get into grocery store or grocery stores or restaurants. Um, how big are the anchor growers? So Nathan Moyer in Richmond, 25 acres of vegetables. He's been in vegetable production his whole life, he learned it from his dad, who lives in Richmond, too. So 25 acres, not huge, but vegetable size, I guess that is huge. Um, you saw his, um, his production. He has probably a five-acre field of pumpkins in the summertime. We walk through a one-acre field of peppers. Um, he has a couple of high tunnels. They were full of romaine lettuce this this fall, so at that scale. Um, another anchor grower is south of Kansas City near El Dorado Springs. <coughs> it's county line produce. It's actually a cooperative unto itself of um, Amish growers. Five growers are working together to, to, to move produ product through one name. And they um, collectively are probably about 15 acres, separated out on five different farms. There's another grower who we hope signs uh, this year, this month. Um, they're down near Rich Hill, so that's straight south of Kansas City on 49 Highway. Um, they are a big conventional producer, but the son of the farmer um, is growing some certified, he has a certified organic um, plot. And so we're talking with him and encouraging him to uh, expand that certified organic plot and sell a handful of these staples 
um, through the hub. Hospitals, not yet. I have a phone number that I need to call. Um, I knock on a door of a hospital for several years now, and, and I kind of use this as a test to how, how far we've come. Um, you know, I call the guy and, and I give him an update of how far we've come, and okay, we have one GAP certified uh, grower, and now we have two, and he still won't talk to me. Um, most hospitals have this contract that we're talking about with uh, U.S. Food or with Costco where 90% of their product has to come through these big companies and then they might have a little bit of space for small growers, but those growers need to be GAP certified too, so we're just not there yet. Schools is really, we're actively pursuing schools. We are actively um, pursuing more corporate cafeterias and I guess we're focusing this year a lot on CSA. We feel like that's a way where we can move even more product to places that we're going to anyway and really even get a premium for the, the product a little bit more than we would get on just selling it straight to that kitchen. Mm -hmm.